Hello, buenos dias. Today we have a session of new approaches to traffic management. I would like to introduce myself. I'm managing director of the association of the municipalities in the metropolitan area, Hannover, Braunschweig, Göttingen, Wolfsburg. And we operate one of the biggest um, electric vehicle, vehicle fleet of Germany or perhaps of uh, Europe. And we have established uh, in, an institution to support the municipalities in Germany in our metropolitan area um, to, to develop strategies or concepts um, in the field of electric mobility. Our theme today is, uh, like I said before, now new approaches to traffic management. I think we will uh, talk about more about solutions than um, about really technical solutions. Um, as urbanization increases, the need for mobility has frequently spurred traffic congestion. Congestion may cause not only economic losses, but also a burden for people's health and the environment through its resulting air pollution. This session aims to explore smart traffic strategies or solutions. How can new approaches to traffic management uh, help cities improve mobility while keeping traffic impacts in check? So, here are very interesting speakers of different countries today. And I'm very proud to present them here in the Smart City Expo World Congress. So I would like to start with Ms. Frauke Fischer. Frauke Fischer entered the Berlin Agency for Electric Mobility in 2013, where she is responsible for smart intermodal passenger transport. She previously st studied business economics in Germany, France and Ecuador and worked in different projects as project manager in Spain, the USA, and Germany. Please. Yeah, um, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome. Bienvenidos, uh, buenas tardes. Um, well, I'm going to talk about um, electromobility um, in, in Berlin, what we've done in the past, what we're currently doing, and also what we um, uh, will do in the future um, in order to address specific uh, requirements of, of cities uh, today and tomorrow. So um, first, a little bit about our background. Um, uh, why does the Berlin Agency for Electromobility exist? Um, this probably is not so new to most of us, but as I'm starting the panel, I thought it can't uh, be bad to have some general aspects. So as you all know, we have a very strong trend of re-urbanization. So people moving back from the countryside to the city. So Berlin is very attractive right now for, it's, it's growing quite, quite rapidly. Um, in parallel, we have uh, new services around mobility that are just now emerging. Um, it's a very interesting uh, situation right now. And um, the peak car use, uh, at least in, in Germany, in Berlin, it's decreasing. So it's, it means that people tend to use their car less often. Nonetheless, at least for Berlin speaking, we have more and more cars in the city. As more people move to the city, even though they are used less, still we have a higher number of cars, which is kind of contradicting with the uh, target to have a uh, livable city uh, instead of a car friendly city. Today nobody wants to live in a car friendly city. Everybody wants to have a livable um, city. So um, taking all that together is kind of the uh, mission why uh, we were created in 2010 as an agency to um, address those global mega trends in order to turn them into smart mobility um, solutions. So EMO uh, itself, is, we are an agency uh, of the state, or we were funded by, by the state. We are a public-private partnership. Um, we have people from universities, from research and development, um, politics, and of course from, from businesses. And we are kind of a neutral platform in the, in the area to bring electromobile concepts, projects, ideas together and create New, new ideas and, and new developments. And um, 
At the moment, we are about 60 companies and players involved in our network, constantly growing. Network from very big players like, like Siemens uh, down to really small startups, so very, uh, very interesting scenes that we, um, we're, we are seeing around this sector of electromobility. So our main goals are really to um, enforce economics, um, to create new jobs, to support businesses, but of course also the um, smart city side to making the city more livable, a better place to live, a cleaner place to live. And um, our, our background, our roots are the um, showcase, international showcase for electromobility. Um, they were created in 2012, four regions in Germany, uh, which is uh, Berlin-Brandenburg, which is uh, Lower Saxony, uh, Baden-Württemberg, and um, Bavaria and Saxony, so four regions, which we are closely cooperating with. In Berlin, we have 30 core projects running from all kinds of areas, energy, um, car sharing, uh, intermodality. And this was basically our route that we came from um, a couple of years ago. So where are we today? What, what, what did we do so far? Um, at the moment, we have about 100 projects in electromobility running in the region, uh, many more in preparations. And we try to address electromobility very widespread, so we don't focus on the, on the car. You probably know that Berlin doesn't have a big car manufacturer. Um, Audi, Mercedes, Volkswagen, they are all located in other parts of Germany. So we have the advantage that, that we can really um, address the topic uh, quite widespread without having the focus on the car. So um, we look into new um, ways of mod uh, mobility like um, electromobile car sharing, uh, which is very popular in Berlin. Uh, we try to address new new quarters, new, new areas, new, new city developments, integrate uh, electromobility in those um, city concepts. Uh, logistics is a really important topic um, that we are um, addressing. Uh, electric buses and, uh, of course, new smart services such as bike sharing, pedelec sharing, uh, scooter sharing. Um, at the moment, we have about 650 publicly accessible uh, charging points, uh, out of which 30 are fast charging, or 31. And um, no, this is not enough. <laughs> we know that. And I was asked that a couple of times already yesterday and today. Uh, so we are enlarging the number. But it's a, quite a stable base to uh, build other uh, services and businesses uh, upon that even though 650 should not be the um, final number. Um, some interesting solution um, that you also see here is um, like the load and parking uh, in, in light posts. You can see one of the solutions also displayed in the Berlin partner booth at B300, I think, row B300. So um, very innovative um, products coming from Germany also in this region. Um, and uh, at, the, at the moment, we have about 3,000 uh, electric vehicles running in, in the streets of Berlin, out of which 320 are running in electric car sharing. And for us, even though 320 might not be so much, for us it's a very important number because we just see that electric car sharing is really the best way to market uh, to marketing um, electric vehicles because you won't bring people to buy an electric car if they have never driven it before and if they just by chance get it in a uh, mixed fleet of car sharing uh, we see that it raises a lot of attention and people talk about it so um, we, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, enlarging this fleet as well um, and another very important focus area for us are fleet managers in um, and companies who operate fleets, um, little by little, replacing um, uh, diesel cars by electric cars. We have a company in Germany now, in Berlin, already running with 100 e-cars uh, e in their fleet. So, quite, quite, uh, quite a success already in just three years. And um, besides those big companies, we have a big uh, emphasis on uh, startups. Um, because already Berlin has become a very interesting hotspot for startups 
and uh, at Emo we really try to support them and give them the help to go into the market. So we created a in our network, especially we call it Emo Club, and it's for startups from the e-mobility business to give them access to the big players, give them access to the market, link them to, to politics if they have certain uh, legal aspect that they uh, need to uh, clarify before starting with their new businesses. And just wanting to present one very interesting startup um, from Berlin, it's called EMEO, and it's the um, electric scooter sharing. And they uh, just started in uh, spring, as you know, scooter sharing, uh, e-scooters is not really good in the winter time in Berlin, a little cold and slippery. But they started um, this just this year and they already have a fleet of 150 e-scooters uh, in a free floating system in Berlin and it's very well accepted. I had my doubts personally because Berlin is not a scooter city. But those are very interesting concepts around e-mobility that are involving at the moment and which we see and which we try to enforce. Nonetheless, we have achieved a lot already, but um, still a lot to do. And there's one figure which really struck me when I saw that. It's the um, target regarding greenhouse gases for Germany. Um, and this is the development you see from 1990 until 2014. Um, and you see that the traffic sector, the red line on the top, has even increased by 1%. Um, and now if we look at the target that we have in just six more years, it's minus 41%. And we have gone plus 1% in the last 24 years. So how are we um, possibly uh, able to, to reach this target? I don't know if we will reach it, but we do our best to get closer to it than we are right now. So we, um, at, in Berlin, we decided to really focus on certain areas for us, that is vehicles, electric vehicles, not so much the development of vehicles itself, but also the integration in, in, in uh, mobility um, concept in traffic systems. Uh, also, we are looking very much at what is really needed in case of vehicles for urban environments. Doesn't always have to be the big four-wheel car. It can be an e-cargo bike, it can be a scooter, uh, whatever. So new types of, of vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we have the uh, topic of urban traffic, so linking electromobility with existing mobility topics. And just very briefly, because the next speaker is going to talk a lot about that, the uh, electromobility in connection to uh, renewable energy is very important to us. And all that we are integrating and in a viable, viable platform in Berlin, so uh, really make it a place of application. So here are just some examples. I, I mentioned most of them. Um, and last but not least, we really believe that you have to get people to drive a car. And I don't know if every one of you has already driven an e-car. So to give you an... Nope, that was... Is the video starting automatically? It's just a... Okay. Nicht mal eine Minute. Okay. Um, we tested it this morning. It was working. Um, because I think one thing is really to um, make people aware that driving an electric vehicle is fun and. Um, well. Oh, okay. Just 45 seconds. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. 
Are there any questions in the audience to this presentation? If not, so we will continue with Professor Kaustub Dar Dargalkar. Yes, that's right. Kaustub is Associate Dean of Business Design at Business School We School in Mumbai, India. He also, he also heads Inno Center for Innovation. Runner-up at the Wharton Innovation Tournament, he was granted the Entre Entrepreneurship Educator and Mentor Award by the Government of India. The theme is a collaborate business model for reducing the real carbon footprint of electric vehicles. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my topic uh, is not really about traffic management, but more about creating a business model for creating the for reducing the real carbon footprint of electric vehicles. Uh, the major challenge that we face today is uh, uh, global warming, and uh, the main uh, effect is uh, that. Uh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sorry. Uh, Global warming uh, is uh, a phenomenon that has been happening for a long time now. For the last 5,000 years, uh, the temperatures have increased by 4 to 7 degrees, and they have happened just by themselves. And today, uh, if we continue the way we are and contribute uh, to the global warming, it's going to rise at 2 to 6 degrees in the next 100 years only. Now, that's a major, major problem. And... Uh, Greenhouse gases that we burn uh, uh, in our uh, fuels are the main culprit, carbon dioxide being the main one. And uh, if we continue uh, uh, the way we are, 23% of carbon dioxide emissions in the world today come from the transportation sector only. If uh, mobility uses same, same fuels today, it's going to increase to 32% by 2030. Uh, and... Uh, of all the carbon dioxide emissions coming from the transportation sector in India, 87% come from road transport alone. Hence, my focus here is going to talk, uh, going to be about reducing the real carbon footprint of the automobile sector. Uh, now, over the last few years, the focus has been on reducing tailpipe emissions, and electric vehicles with zero tailpipe emissions seem to offer the greenest solutions. Uh, but where does this electricity really come from? This electricity comes from the normal grid that we uh, access, and 87% uh, of, uh, sorry, 83% of the electricity generated globally comes from non-renewable sources like uh, coal and natural gas. So my question is, uh, is the electric vehicle really a green option? At best, uh, electric vehicles create a cleaner city, uh, but it actually pollutes the countryside where uh, the thermal energy plants are located. So uh, unless electric vehicles draw electricity from renewable resources, we cannot say that an electric vehicle is really a green option. <coughs> For electric vehicles to become really a green and a clean option, they should draw electricity from renewable sources such as solar, biomass, wind, thermal, geothermal, sorry, not thermal, uh, wind, uh, tidal, etc. Uh, let us look at what electric vehicles are doing today. Uh, the current business model focuses on these factors, overcoming range anxiety. Range anxiety is the anxiety that a person faces that uh, in the middle of a journey, the electric vehicle battery might get recharged. So uh, rightly, uh, electric vehicle manufacturers are focusing on uh, uh, increasing the capacity of battery packs. Uh, secondly, uh, they are trying to reduce recharging times. At present, a normal home connection charges an electric vehicle in about six to eight hours. Even uh, Tesla's quick charge technology takes 20 to 30 minutes to recharge the vehicle for maybe another 270 kilometers or so. But it is not as convenient as uh, going to a gas station, waiting for three minutes, filling gas, and moving off. 
So this is an inconvenience. Electric vehicle manufacturers are trying to uh, compensate for that. Uh, the third point is that they are trying to improve the recharging infrastructure by providing more recharging points. And finally, they're trying to lower electric vehicle costs. All these attempts, uh, no doubt, are in the right direction. But uh, what about the carbon footprint of the electricity generation? For this, we need to create a different business model wherein clean energy generation becomes a part of the ecosystem of the electric vehicle manufacturer. How can this be made to happen? Uh, we got to create an ecosystem integrating all these renewable sources uh, and uh, to, to, to reduce the carbon footprint and a higher popularity of electric vehicles. Uh, here's what I propose. Uh, the, sorry. Uh, the electric vehicle uh, manufacturers should have a holding company that invests in various satellite companies that generate clean energy from all these sources. Garbage collection, that is solid waste, small micro hydro power plants, tidal energy, geothermal energy, wind farms, and solar energy. Uh, the energy thus generated should be uploaded on a smart grid and the holding company should be granted equivalent energy credits the electric vehicle manufacturers could use these credits to recharge, to recharge the batteries of electric vehicles that are sold by them at authorized service stations. The excess credits left can be used by them for trading with other electric vehicle manufacturing companies or other such carbon heavy uh, companies, industries. Uh, thereby, we can create a thriving secondary market for gear green energy credits uh, governments should offer lucrative tax benefits for income generated from trading of these credits. Now, this really needs a smart collaboration between various agencies and the government. Uh, so where are the uh, electric vehicle manufacturers going to get additional revenue from? Uh, listed here, uh, they're going to get fees for recharging electric vehicles on a recurrent basis. Uh, they are going to get uh, market price for the surplus energy generated, and they are going to get revenue from sale of energy credits as well. Uh, to understand the impact of this uh, proposed models, uh, I have taken the case study of uh, Mumbai city in India, uh, and have explored two energy, uh, two renewable energy resources such as biomass and solar. Let us look at biomass first. Uh, Mumbai has a population of. 21 million people, each generating close to 650 grams of solid waste every day. Uh, that amounts to a whopping 13,650 tons of solid waste every day. Assuming only 40% of this is collected, and assuming that out of that collected, uh, uh, the efficiency of conversion is only 50%, uh, we can generate 448 gigawatt hours of electrical power every year and that will be enough to charge 67,237 electric vehicles per year. Assuming that one vehicle runs for 20,000 kilometers per year, actually 20,000 kilometers per year is a pretty high run for a city dweller in India. It is more like 10 to 15,000 kilometers per hour, per year. So actually the 67,000 could be 100,000 to 134,000 vehicles recharged per year. Now let us move to uh, solar uh, energy. Uh, Mumbai is blessed with uh, about eight hours of bright sunshine for 300 days a year. I have considered only five hours out of those because that's the angle of incidence of the solar uh, on panels that can be effectively converted into electricity. Uh, uh, Mumbai has uh, 90 gas stations, approximately 90 gas stations, uh, each covering an area of half, uh, uh, half an acre. And if these uh, gas stations are covered by solar panels, that will uh, generate uh, energy enough to power, to recharge 9,630 uh, 9, electric vehicles per year. Once again, com considering the average of 20,000 kilometers running per year, it could be m less, so the number of vehicles could be a lot more. Now, uh, to demonstrate the uh, business model in action, uh, here's a short film. Let us hope it runs. Yeah. Uh, that's Mumbai city, uh, garbage collection, 
13,650 tons of garbage, uh, solid waste, every single day, uh, going into a, a processing center. That's where it goes into. All that uh, garbage, in, uh, soft, uh, the solid waste uh, processed, generates uh, electricity, gets uploaded into a smart grid. That's an electric vehicle uh, running across the city. At the end, uh, it runs out of battery. That's the gas station covered with solar panels. Solar energy, electricity comes from that grid, from the smart grid at the petrol pump, at the gas station. A dish electric vehicle with a discharged uh, battery comes there, swaps it for a recharged battery and goes off. That's how it will actually run in action. Now here we have considered uh, only uh, biomass and solar. The other uh, uh, the renewable sources which can be considered will add further to the green quotient. Uh, now the actual operations are going to be like this. Uh, electric vehicles uh, are expensive today. Yeah, uh, uh, Electric vehicles are expensive today because 20 to 25 percent of its cost uh, comes from the battery alone. So I'm proposing the sale of an electric vehicle without a battery and providing the battery as a subscription service. Uh, the uh, electric vehicle comes to the, uh, to the uh, gas station, swaps a battery for a recharged battery. Uh, this swappable battery technology was developed by Shai Agassi in uh, 2007, so it can be used. Advanced telematics can be used to actually predict the stocking patterns of, uh, of the batteries at various stations. That is, a battery can have sensors which tell the amount of recharge left in it, the kind of route that it takes, and accordingly, uh, on that route, uh, the batteries could be stocked. Now, that's where, uh, that's how it uh, will operate. What are the benefits to the consumer? Obviously, low upfront cost, uh, a smoother and a seamless uh, uh, recharging experience. Obviously, uh, uh, higher adoption will result. Uh, what are the impacts on the ecosystem? Uh, decrease in real carbon footprint uh, since we are creating an end-to-end -end, uh, renewable energy channel. Uh, by creating uh, energy credit market, there will be a healthy competition between auto manufacturers to produce as much green energy as possible, uh, thus driving the cost of uh, energy down further. Uh, citizen engagement will be higher uh, due to uh, lower costs, which will fuel demand further for electric vehicles. Uh, this model uses the existing infrastructure uh, and hence it's not going to be very, very investment heavy. The investments are not going to be heavy. Now, I have put forth this business model for an electric vehicle, but as you must have got it, in a sense it can be used and replicated for, uh, for any electric appliance that uses electricity, uh, such as an air conditioner, a microwave, a computer, a mobile phone, everything around us. Now, uh, that's, that's the power of collaborative models between uh, government, uh, electric appliance manufacturers, and uh, various other agencies. Now, before I end, I would uh, like to acknowledge the contributions of my colleagues, Mr. Akshay Gorkar, helping me with data collection, and Swapnil Chaudhary, who has uh, helped me make the animated film. Uh, thank you. And we are really looking for... Uh, uh, some uh, good participation for these kinds of models uh, across the world. Uh, Mumbai is just a case study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dagalka. Um, I see the themes are very interesting, and so uh, 10 minutes are very short. But has anybody a question to Professor da <laughs> Dagalka? If Ah, there's one person behind. Uh, we have a microphone here. Yeah. Yes, uh, just a question. Uh, all these models, do they take into consideration the effect on environment? Uh, two clear points. Wind energy, collecting wind energy. What is, is there are studies, what is the effect or the long-term effect on weather changes? Are there any research on this area? Because we are advancing new energies, but are there 
enough research to see, okay, with energy is very good, what is the long-term weather change? This is one example. Another example is on batteries. What is the lifespan of a battery? What are we going to do with all these batteries, which are very toxic materials in batteries? So are these all models, all this renewable energy, are they taking into consideration the long-term uh, effect on environment? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, definitely an interesting question. Uh, the uh, effect of, I have right now studied uh, the effect of collection of solid waste and solar. Wind is in the pipeline. As you rightly said, uh, wind farms do alter energy patterns. So that uh, has been kept aside at the moment uh, right now, yes. Uh, and the actual uh, complete uh, cradle to grave kind of, uh, of uh, life cycle for the electric batteries, yes, it is uh, definitely uh, uh, not researched as much yet. But it, in the overall impact, my focus has been on creating a, an end-to-end -end green channel for uh, right from energy generation to energy consumption. It is not just focused on the electric vehicle. My focus is more on uh, where the electricity generated is coming from and uh, creating green sources of energy uh, to be put up in the grid uh, to counter today's 83% uh, of energy that we consume comes from uh, non-renewable sources. So the attempt has been to integrate renewable sources at the back end. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we continue with Mr. Karl Otto Schölkopf. He is from Thyssen Elevator 80. He is head of product management for High Rise Global, and he will present about the contribution of the elevator industry for higher mobility for people in cities, horizontally and vertically. So thank you for the introduction, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a pleasure to stay here and to have this great audience. And uh, I would not like to talk. Uh, I would like to talk about vehicles which are already driven by electrical uh, energy. But uh, you will see that there is also in the field of uh, escalator and elevator systems still room for improvement to improve the situation for human mobility in cities. But let's start first with a short video. Background for developing new technologies in people transportation in vertical and in horizontal direction. Of course, there's a high demand of the ongoing urbanization in these areas around the globe. And while actually the half of the world's population is already lives in urban areas today, it is suspected that by 2050, more or less 70% of human beings will live in cities. Consequently, this needs more and more cities will grow significantly. Moving people as we are doing today, either by individual cars, by buses, by taxis and so on, will lead more and more into chaotic traffic conditions. Therefore, metros are one of the mass transit options of choice in the future. 
but how to bring the passengers in shortest time to metro stations in other challenges is another challenge. The connectivity of the metro networks has to be improved and we have to accelerate the transit times dramatically and to improve the comfort of life and metros as well. And looking to the carbon footprint, there is no question that we have to act as soon as possible. But how can this work? So with Excel, Thyssen Group Elevator has introduced now, just a few days ago, a new and innovative technology we developed a walkway with two speeds and it combines a smooth speed change between the normal and used uh, speed if you step on a move walkway and you will be accelerated up to 2 or 2.5 meter per second. So and this uh, gives a high, a high safety comfort and a comfortable ride. So all the, the people coming from outlying districts can use it to reach their next metro stations quickly and without waiting periods, which depends with the need of unprofitable, unprofitable bus systems. At airports, this revolutionary technology saves passengers two-thirds of their time without, with they, and they can spend more time to go to the uh, stores on site. So the Excel system provides the features up to two meters per second over a length of up to 500 meters in one piece. And we really can say this is an exciting, continuous, high-speed, horizontal transportation system. So for the application, of course, typically for metro stations and to link, to make a link between uh, metro lines, and of course, this will be also a continuous horizontal transportation system with high speed, but also with a distinctive focus for metro feeders, but not only. So we can feed the metro stations, but also give a, 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 a link between uh, event centers, for example, between buildings uh, for the public transportation in exhibition centers like here, and of course in tame parks. So it's an improved technology. So what about now the vertical transportation? So as we learned already, cities are growing. And this means considering severe restrictions on space and limitations also in the realization of uh, infrastructure, the most economic solution is to accommodate this rapidly growing to build buildings higher and higher. This will allow us to occupy less soil to secure essential green areas for the cities and finally it would help also to control an intelligent energy distribution. There is really an ongoing trend in super and mega tall buildings and this expects a significant potential for new innovation as we call it the multi. So actually we have already 63 cities worldwide with more than 3 million inhabitants. Since 2000, the number of high-rise buildings has tripled buildings above 200 meters. And of course, we cannot imagine that megacities with such high number of people will work and will, can be operated without high-rise buildings. So these high-rise buildings need vertical transportation infrastructure for going live with a high level of availability. And if you see here in the examples which I put on the, on the screen here, it's around the world, around the globe. So, but actually, if we increase the height of the building demands consequently, of course, the number of elevators has to be increased, which means at the end that we will reach a higher footprint and this make, will make the buildings inefficient. If you see here, for example, Shanghai Tower on the left screen, yeah, you see the big core for the elevator systems and you see the rest of the rentable space around. So this is, makes really inefficient. So one of the tasks is that the new technology has to uh, need safe, to save space and to optimize building footprints. But there are also some other challenges for the industry 
Elevator system are equipped with ropes. If we extend the length of the ropes immediately, the masses will increase, which means the rope systems will come to a limit because they cannot, cannot carry any more their own weight. Architects that like really uh, also inclined shapes. Actually, elevator can only solve in direct vertical direction. So with a new system, which we're uh, pro uh, developing now, we can also follow inclined lines. Of course, these height buildings, they can move. They have to move because of statical reasons. But this has a direct influence on the behavior of the elevator system because of the ropes starting to sway and it can cause damages and even breakdowns. And last but not least, of course, actually elevators are not able to move in horizontal direction. With a new multi-system, we can go also in and move people in horizontal direction. So this is a challenge to eliminate these limitators by this new technology. So what's now behind? You see here the system and what you also see on our booth, on, look to the right side. So it's a linear motor technology and two elo the elevator systems are running in a loop by means driven by a linear motor. And um, both of these shafts, or even more, can be uh, linked by a so-called exchanger so that the elevators can also move in a horizontal direction. So it's a proven uh, technology already with a linear motor coming from the maglev train, which is running in Shanghai or in other areas. So to control the independent movement of the cabins, we can use our safety features, which we are already introduced in the market with our twin, the system with two caps moving in one shaft and coming from the past, this, let me say, moving paternoster system, which few of you made now in the past, is really the optimum for a continuous traffic flow. So, Coming from the idea, this is a research work in, in the past, which we have finalized in November 2014. Actually, we announced a one to three model uh, in operation already in November this year in Gijong, in our uh, research center. And the plan is actually to bring the market launch in 2090 to reality. So, as mentioned before, super and mega high-rise buildings are developed more and more to operate like cities. Therefore, there is no surprise that solution for the vertical transportation concept in those buildings will be equal to modern horizontal public traffic infrastructure. Fast trains in long distance service with only a few stops from hub to hub where they change, where we can change for, by local transportation system like metros, buses, or even auto service. So this concept will have a focus with multi as well. So use the multi as a long distance transportation system for main entrance to transfer lobbies and change to local elevators with short distances. Please come to the end. Yeah, so. So this is some, some, some uh, examples how we can do it to combine a multi-system as a long-distance transportation system with machine room lifts or even now with a twin system to optimize still the space saving. And to give you an example from a real project, uh, which is actually blind by the architect and the consultants only with double decks. You can see in a combination with a multi and with a twin system, different elevators, what we can save. On footprint, in the shuttle system, more than 20, 20%, and in the local areas, more than 30%. So this is real beneficial. So to come to the end, this new system will provide reduced footprint by the same handling capacity, will give a significant gain for the facility net, net ratio in buildings, we do not have any restrictions in height or in shape. We have less passenger queuings in the lobby areas, and this enables us again to reduce the area. We have more uptime availability to, to have more cabins in the loop. And of course, looking to the commercial side, even the break even of investment, we assume between four to six years, depending on configuration and rental rate. 
So I would like to invite you, come with us to enter into a new area of vertical and horizontal mobility in smart cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Scholkopf. If there are any questions in the audience, so we have to hurry up a little bit. And I would like to welcome to Isabel Tejero. She is an industrial engineer, smart city business manager in Sinovia, which is a company of Cofeli Ineo Group ND. She lives in Spain, but she is working for France. She's told, told me, and she will introduce an application as solution for better mobility. Please. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, someone has told me that I had the chance of speaking Spanish, and if you don't mind, I'm going to take this uh, opportunity uh, because I'm more fluent in, in English, uh, in Spanish than in English. In any case, if there is any question at the end of my presentation, I would like to, to answer uh, it or them. Just in English. So, vamos a empezar. Well, there, there are some. Well, people have said that, that I had the chance of, of speaking Spanish, so, well, I don't mind. I can try it. I can try. <laughs> so, there, let's do it. We have interpreters here, and you yeah, can yeah, yeah, no. take your. Yeah, there are some. For translation. Devices there. What, in Spanish or in English? You can speak in well, can speak Spanish. Spanish course, there are, there are uh, interpreters and you can take... English, well, okay, okay let's, let's do it in English. So there are a lot of uh, cities around the world that they try to be more attractive to citizens, to tourists, to business uh, by doing some politics that try to, how to say it, um, improve the security, they improve the services that they are given uh, to their citizens mainly, but also the all people that they're interested in that city. So, um, I, I think I'm going to change it, but it's going to be more easy. Bueno, pues eh, dentro del interés que hay dentro de todas estas ciudades de ser más atractivas y evidentemente pues eh, dar unos servicios que mejoren el servicio a este ciudadano, está, por ejemplo, y es uno de los ejes, está la movilidad. La movilidad, por ejemplo, eh, enfocada no solo desde el punto de vista del de ciudadano que se va a encontrar con una serie de problemas a la hora de aparcar, la movilidad también desde el punto de vista de el municip del, del municipio, eh, para que va a recoger una serie de eh, bonificaciones que después va a utilizar para realizar otra serie de mejoras dentro de la propia ciudad. También enfocado a mejorar, por ejemplo, el centro de esa ciudad, no dejando que haya tanto circulación, eh, dejando que una serie de ciudad, de una serie de calles, pues no tengan acceso a vehículos, pero también respetando la sostenibilidad del ambiente, eh, de manera que el CO2 las emisiones pues, se puedan reducir de manera considerable. Uno de estos ejes, como decíamos, es la movilidad. Y dentro de la movilidad, eh, Cofelineo pues, tiene mucha experiencia. Hemos estado muchos años trabajando al servicio de las ciudades, al servicio de los ciudadanos, y sabemos qué es lo que necesitan y qué es lo que podemos ofrecer. Yupi es una aplicación que se ha estado desarrollando en los últimos tiempos que permite desarrollar precisamente esto, acercar al ciudadano Mejoras que le permitan reducir el tiempo de aparcar, saber dónde dirigirse, saber cuál es el recorrido más corto para poder llegar allí donde quiere y a la vez tener toda esta información por parte del municipio para poder establecer políticas que mejoren la circulación dentro de esa ciudad. También, en paralelo, vamos a ayudarnos de los agentes que van a estar gestionando todos los parquímetros de manera que se puedan realizar políticas de mejora a la hora de establecer precios y de también establecer actuaciones para mejorar los propios eh, sistemas de pago. Como os decía, hay tres, eh, esta aplicación tiene tres focos. Uno es el ciudadano, otro es el municipio en sí, los técnicos que gestionan el servicio 
y también eh, la, lo, los políticos que después van a establecer las políticas de mejora eh, de la movilidad en ese territorio. Y por último, los agentes. Empezamos, si os parece, por parte del ciudadano. ¿Qué beneficios hay? ¿Quién de nosotros no ha gastado más de un depósito dando vueltas alrededor de un lugar intentando aparcar? Seguro que muchos de vosotros. ¿Quién de vosotros no ha estado en una reunión y ha ido a coger el coche y después resulta que de aparcarlo en una zona azul se le ha pasado el tiempo y tiene una multa? Y sin duda, a lo mejor estos dos puntos anteriores ninguno de vosotros se ha visto afectado, pero sin duda en el último eh, todos nos hemos visto en alguna ocasión, que es no saber dónde hemos dejado el coche una vez lo hemos aparcado y no sabemos dónde empezar a buscar. Esta aplicación enfocada al ciudadano permite solucionar, por ejemplo, estos problemas. Primeramente vamos a poder visualizar cuál es la oferta que tenemos de aparcamiento en una zona determinada. Puede ser alrededor nuestro o puede ser en el objetivo de dónde vamos a ir, al destino donde nos vamos a dirigir. Vamos a poder saber esta información basándonos tanto en sensores como utilizando ya equipamiento existente en la ciudad, como pueden ser las cámaras. No vamos a utilizar estos sistemas para decir hay uno, dos, tres sitios en este lugar donde vas a ir. Vamos a utilizar probabilidades, el conocimiento de esas instalaciones a base de datos que se han recogido eh, con datos históricos, me refiero a días de la semana, eh, si es un festivo, no es un festivo, si resulta la hora del día, si es cuando la gente se está yendo a trabajar, si es cuando vuelve. Todo esto vamos, nos va a dar probabilidades a la hora de establecer hacia dónde nos vamos a dirigir a buscar un, un lugar para aparcar. Podremos dirigir en nuestra aplicación, podremos escoger si preferimos ver un mapa, si podemos ver una realidad aumentada, si podemos ver una lista de cuáles son los sitios que tienen más probabilidad de que encontrar un lugar. A la vez, podemos, poder, eh, estas, podemos prever cuáles son nuestras rutas y escoger cuál es la zona a la cual nos vamos a ir. Podemos escoger también el interés en encontrar un determinado puesto de, para aparcar. Si somos un transportista, vamos a querer buscar zonas de carga y descarga. Si resulta que somos un discapacitado, vamos a buscar específicamente esas áreas. A lo mejor queremos ir a dirigirnos a un parking que esté cubierto o a lo mejor una zona azul o una zona verde. Podremos escoger también todas estas características a la hora de escoger nuestras preferencias a la hora de aparcar. Podremos, como os comentaba antes, definir dónde ha dejado el, hemos dejado el coche para poder volver ahí posteriormente sin tener que estar dando vueltas alrededor de, del distrito. Y también podemos estar avisados eh, de cuándo se nos acaba el tiempo de una zona de pago determinada. Tenemos esta experiencia ya en forma de piloto en algunas ciudades en Francia, como por, por ejemplo es Bordeaux. Vamos a ver el punto de vista del, del ciudadano, ay, del, del alcalde o bien de los técnicos que están gestionando el servicio. Para los políticos van a tener datos de manera general de cómo se está gestionando este, este servicio a lo, largo de, a lo largo y ancho de toda la ciudad, viendo cuáles son las zonas que tienen más aglomeración, cuáles son las que están más libres y poder, por ejemplo, establecer cuáles son los precios más apropiados para poder dirigir el tráfico de una zona a otra. Podremos ver también, hacer estudios de eh, cuándo se carga más una calle que otra, ver el tipo de vehículo que, es, que se está cargando en estas zonas y también cruzar datos tanto de la movilidad como con otros datos que se estén disponiendo en, en el propio municipio, como pueden ser, por ejemplo, datos económicos o datos pues, eh, mejor de colegios o de mm, otros servicios, pueden ser, por ejemplo, recogidas de basura, y que nos pueden interesar ver de qué manera afecta al tráfico. Y por último, vamos a ver también las ventajas que tienen pues, para los agentes que están controlando que estos parquímetros estén funcionando y que no hayan infracciones. A través de una tablet van a poder disponer de la información de dónde se está pagando, no se está pagando, dónde se supone que hay un índice de pago diferente al índice de ocupación para poderse dirigir ahí y poder ver dónde se están produciendo estas, estas infracciones, como decía. También utilizamos, como os comentaba, sobre todo en algunos sitios, no se puede en España, pero sí, por ejemplo, en Francia, utilizar las ventajas que nos ofrecen sistemas como son las cámaras, el sistema de videovigilancia, para... Eh, poder ver si se tiene una, un aviso de que ha habido una infracción o de que ha habido un problema con una determinada, eh, un par, determinado parquímetro, ver 
vía cámara si esto es verdad o no es verdad y a lo mejor establecer cuál es la mejor actuación para poder llegar ahí en el mínimo tiempo y también pues con sabiendo qué es lo que se va a tener que hacer. One minute. Y por último, decir que todo esto obviamente no se coge, se da un municipio y ya nos olvidamos, sino que tenemos un back office que va a adaptar estas soluciones a cada una de las ciudades. Eh, va a poder también solucionar cualquier tipo de problema con el servicio que se les ofrece de ayuda telefónica y eh, de estas maneras también se puede coger y adaptar esta solución a posibles soluciones de terceros que se puedan integrar dentro de la misma solución. Poco más. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for your presentation. Is there any questions? So we will continue because we have a very short time. Now I will introduce to Mrs. Li Li. She is a senior engineer at East China Research Institute of Electronic Engineering. And her topic today is a solution for parking data acquisition and release. Please Thank start. You. Thank you. Uh, good, enough, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our solution for city range dynamic solution for information acquisition and release. Uh, in many cities of China, parking becomes a big problem. People's, people prefer... Okay, okay, thanks. Not to go somewhere because they cannot find a place to park. Uh, there are several methods to solve the problem, such as uh, parking on the roadside and building more parking lots or providing uh, guiding source. However, there are such shortages of these methods. Our system uh, provides uh, the following information, uh, such as, uh, firstly, is the location and the tow information of the garage and the roadside parking lots. Secondly, the return available uh, parking space. Based on this information, uh, the system can provide the right uh, service, such as uh, uh, parking space renting and realization, and guarding inside a uh, parking garage. garage. Uh, there are several advantages of this system. The main advantage is that the dy dynamic parking information of both roadside parking lots and the parking garages is integrated to one data center to reliable re city ranging parking information release. Besides, the system is easy to install and maintain and is flexible to expense. Uh, this uh, system architecture, both the garage information acquisition and uh, acquisition system and the roadside information acquisition system share the same data center. The uh, system also provides web service and the post service and uh, uh, mobile apps. Uh, it's the garage information acquisition, acquisition system. There are two detectors which are installed uh, on the entrance and uh, access uh, of the garage. When vehicles come into the uh, garage, the uh, vehicle counts at one. On the entry, on the, country, the, uh, the vehicle counts minus. minus. This is the roadside data acquisition system. Uh, the detectors are installed in the parking spaces. When a park uh, is, is uh, when, car, uh, when we, s when a vehicle parks the uh, slot, then information will transport to the data center. And uh, when people check the information, they will find the parking lot is not available. Uh, it's the app's interface. 
uh, people can use the apps to check uh, the available uh, parking space and uh, pay uh, and uh, pay for the parking fees. There are three key products in the system. First is uh, the genomic med medical vehicle detector. First, uh, secondly is the relay, and the third is the gateway. <coughs> it's the application of the, our system in Anhui province of China. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Li Li, for this presentation. So, last but not least, <laughs> here is uh, Mr. I have, I have it here, uh, Naresh Kumar from the New Delhi Municipal Council. He's the chairman there. And please start your presentation. Thank you very much. And very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, being an, a practitioner, so I'll try to give an, a perspective from an, a practitioners in the urban city, in the urban management affairs. Today, when we are sitting here in the Smart City Expo, the World Congress, and all of you are the distinguished experts in the field of smart city management, whether it is in the field of a physical infrastructure, social infrastructure, economic infrastructure, or the institutional infrastructure, or a enabler in the shape of an ICT in all these infrastructure to make the life of the people in the urban areas alleviable, a system which is very efficient and very economic. So therefore, with that presumption, I will try to draw your attention or flagging certain issues which will be very important from the practitioner's perspective. Fortunately or unfortunately, we have an, a more than 100 years of experience in the development of a transport system in this world. So by this 100 years plus experience, today we know where we stand today as far as the transport engineering is concerned. Similarly, on that application of the ICT in the transport management, that is again the world is seeing the development and the growth in the last 20 to 30 years. So when the topic for today's session was kept in new approaches to the traffic management, I would like to draw the issues which is primarily concerning with the urban areas in the developing world. Today, that 40% plus urban population, the 70 plus percent is, is coming from not a developed country. And by 2010, the ratio will become, when the urbanization will become more than 87%, the 85% will come from that the cities which are today is a part of the developing world. So this concept of new, the session which is focusing the new approaches will depend upon the area of the which part of the world you are talking about. So for me, when I'm traveling today by road from Barcelona to Paris, and if my wipers takes care of the precipitation in the air and informing me whether the rainy season, rain, I can meet the rains in the next 10 or 15 minutes. That perhaps will be the demand for this part of the world. So that I can manage my further driving to the Paris in a such a way that I'm taking care of the fuel consumption in a decent way. But when I'm talking about an urban center in Indonesia or in India or Bangladesh, there you have to bring in a something which is perhaps the world already knows so the, what, I'm, what I've realized it as a practitioner today is that the people are working or the organizations are working or even like the various firms on the planet is working in a, absolutely in a standalone type of system. Today the world is looking, when I'm talking about the traffic management, to give an integrated solution to the traffic management. 
And all these things are already there. It is not something which we have to reinvent. That is why I said in the beginning, when we have a 100 years experience on, on the transport engineering, and another 30 years of experience on working on the ICT, so the everything is already on the board. The only thing is now time has come to develop or evolve an integrated system, depending upon e, whether I'm, I'm hailing from a small city, or I come from a middle type of city, or it is in a large cities like Delhi, eh, which have you know, like today uh, more than a 14 million uh, ridership per day. And out of that 14 million ridership, that 10 million ridership is through the motorized vehicle. So that is in a magnitude, that is in a challenge which the urban cities are being face, facing today. So my request to all of you would be that time has come to give an integrated solution which takes care of all the dimensions of the traffic because that mobility is becoming an important issue in the urban centers today. Our experience in Delhi, when we created a BRT corridor on a small area, it was not a successful model. But when we created a BRT in the other cities in the India, it was a very successful model. So why the thing has gone wrong in a one area, why the thing has gone very, very efficiently and very effectively, these are the things where I request the experts like you and the World Congress to focus on it. Because the solution to the Latin America perhaps require a different customizations, different configurations as compared to the other Asian cities. But at the but what are, what we are experiencing in the last uh, last uh, few almost two decades now, okay, that solutions are available. Whether I want to have on a real time basis information about the public transport in any city, it is possible. The only thing I have to see that whether it is a cost effective for that particular city, or whether it is or whether it is. Uh, it is adoptable by the people of that area because they may be on a different stage of the learning curve. So they may need on a different treatment. Their requirement of the reliability factor may not be 99.99% which your system can deliver today. But perhaps like with, with a 95% reliability, I can give them in a solution which is very cost effective and which, is, which meets the requirement of the people of that part of the world. So, I again, like uh, the cost of reiteration, I'm saying it, okay, my request to you would be that we develop an, a system which cater the need, an integrated system for all the facets of the city management or a smart city, which we are discussing here for the last two days, so that the city can adopt those solutions. Huh? For example, like when my colleague was started, when he was talking about uh, waste to energy thing, uh, like we are also working in a Delhi on a waste to energy thing, energy aspects. See, the Europe has started waste to energy about more than 100 years back. I mean, even today also, like the North America is not working up to that extent. But waste to energy required in a different design from engineering perspective from a country like uh, India. Or even within a country like India, depending upon the size of the city, you need in a different treatment. Because the type of the waste which is coming will be different. The volume of the waste which is coming will be different. And then the collection process may be a different. So you have to design a system which cater the need of, let's say, in a small city with a 100,000 population. But for designing in a system where the population, like my friend was telling, where the collection is 13,000 plus ton per day, need on a different design. So even on the waste to energy aspects, like the Europe has developed a very good standard on the environment controls. But we have to see whether there is a time has come to increase those standards or not. Because as we are discussing for the last two days, that sustainability is a major issue before us. So at the end, I would like to conclude that, okay, that if this Congress can focus its attention in the subsequent uh, such uh, program that we given a tailor, given a, a broad solution to the different type of the cities, taking care of all the dimensions of the smart city, 
so that the cities with a little bit customization or a configuration can adopt those solutions. And again, at the last, I am very grateful to the organizer who has given an opportunity to when a practitioner like me to speak before all of you who are very distinguished, who are an experts in your own areas, and where a practitioner like me may not have an, that type of expertise. So therefore, I may not be able to comment on those the technical aspects, but we are applying these tools for a city which is one of the largest cities in the world today. And the New Delhi Municipal Council, we are providing the civic amenities, even though we are not directly dealing with the transport sector as such. But other than the transport, all the civic amenities we are providing in the city. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. So now we have seen how complex this theme is to, to find solutions for our future smart cities and how a lot we have to do to, uh, today to develop real smart cities and to find and develop and realize the solution around the theme. So thank you very much for telling us your solutions, your concepts, your best practice and your experience. So I would like to welcome you for another day, for another Congress, and goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>